Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today, I'm going to answer more three body problem questions and talk more about the biology of the Santi, how they work with the ETO, and how the Sofans work. This episode contains no spoilers and should be safe for anyone who has read the first book or watched the first season on Netflix. So let's get into it. The first question on the list is how do the Santi communicate? Now we know from the show, the Santi don't understand lying, and upon learning that it comes quite naturally to humans, they cut ties with Mike Evans and allow the destruction of Judgment Day. But what is it about their biology that makes it so they can't understand the concept of a lie? Many people's first inclination is to assume that they have a hive mind, or something like a unified consciousness, where once one being learns something, everyone else knows it too, and it happens instantly without talking. It's like having a superpower of collective knowledge and decision making. And it's easy to see why most people assume this is the case with the Santi, but it's actually not quite the case. And I would like to push back on that idea. From what we know from the books, they communicate in a way that their thoughts are visual for everyone to see, like light or bioluminescence. There's no way to hide what is thought or expressed. This would of course limit their thoughts being shared to anyone who could see them, but not to the entire race or civilization. They aren't telepathic. This adds a little more nuance to their limited understanding of deception. This also clears up some of the confusion about how the Santi pacifist was able to contact Yat Wensia and alert her, because at first glance, it would seem like the pacifist was deceiving others of its own race, but actually, it was just making a clear-cut line of communication. The pacifist knew, the moment it was questioned, that the truth of the situation would be visible, and it made the communication with Yetwensia knowing this. It's actually a really beautiful moment where one creature falls in love with a distant beautiful planet from afar and warns its inhabitants to save them, condemning its own species in the process, in a similar manner that when Yat responds, she condemns her own species as well. There's a bigger conversation to be had about the morality of this whole exchange, and I love that aspect of the books. The pacifist Santi isn't deceiving anyone. It is simply sending a warning, knowing that they will absolutely be caught and punished. To our human understanding, it looks like deception, but it's not. It also helps us understand what had the Santi so scared to the point they abandoned Mike Evans. It's not just the fact that humans are capable of lying, but our biology differs so much that we are capable of deceiving someone when we are standing face to face with them. They simply cannot trust another species who can so easily do this. The biology of the Santi is just really different from our own. They are almost like a sapient and sentient mix between a tardigrade that can survive while dried out, deep sea species that use bioluminescence for communication, like a lanternfish, or something like a firefly. I'll let you use your imagination to think of what something like this could possibly look like to create your own headcanon. But in the words of Sofan, humans probably wouldn't enjoy what the Santi look like. The next question is if the Santi don't understand how to hide their intentions and they don't understand lies and storytelling, how did they create the VR game? And this is pretty easy to clear up. The way it's presented in the show, the Santi didn't create the game. 
they provided the technology and the ETO developed it as a recruitment tool. In the books, the VR game isn't some supernatural high-tech mystery, it's just a regular VR headset that scientists become slightly obsessed with because the riddle of solving the three-body problem starts consuming them. In my opinion, it's a change that works fine for the TV adaptation. Moving forward, how was Tatiana able to become invisible on the cameras? The simple answer is that the Sofans are scrubbing her from the footage. She isn't invisible. This probably answers one question, but leads to another. And that's how do the Sofans do that? Well, the Sofans are just protons that have been unfolded into extra dimensions. They can pass through walls and no place is really safe. This allows them to see and hear all. It also has the benefit of being a computer the size of a subatomic particle. It has the ability to burn a countdown onto people's retinas, scrub footage from cameras, and cause a power failure on Wade's jet. Its main goal was to scare humans and disrupt scientific research, and that's basically their whole purpose. Is it a bit of a plot hole? Couldn't they just kill the wall facers and turn everyone else mad like the scientists who killed themselves? Sure, but it's science fiction and a little hand wavy. If you kill everyone off, that would make for a pretty short story. From a writing aspect, the Sofans are a cool plot device, but also are so overpowered, and as the story moves forward, it's hard to keep things exciting if the Sofans just wipe everyone out with their full potential. All you really need to know is that the Santi aren't as fixated on killing people as they are with disrupting technological advancement. We've also seen that the Santi are still in contact with some humans who aid them, like the man who shot at Saul. And it makes sense that they would keep some human allies around, because if you understand how a proton works, you might be able to guess what methods could take place to disrupt them. But if I go any further into that, it starts to wander into spoiler territory, and if Netflix gets a second season, it's very likely they will explore that. The next question is, how does a wall facer work when the Sofans can see everything? At first glance, it would seem the main aspects of being a wall phaser is you cannot discuss your plans and you can't really write anything down, otherwise the Sofans will see it. So how can they plan anything? And that's a really fun concept because it relies on humans' ability to deceive. Say you need assistance for one part of your plan and you need someone to crunch numbers for you. The data is out in the open, but the Sofans can't read your mind, therefore they don't know exactly what you are planning. The goal is to have a plan within a plan that is known to no one but yourself. The wall facers can do, say, and write whatever they want, giving them full access to unlimited funds to sow seeds of doubt while constantly using misdirection as a tool. And they have a very long time to do it because humans figured out hibernation technology and the Santi won't show up for another 400 years. It's a long time to spin many wheels all at once and come up with plans hidden within plans like nesting dolls. The next question is about the plans of the Santi. Why would they waste their resources and come to Earth rather than using those resources to fix their planet's own problems? And the answer is pretty clear cut if you've been paying attention. The homeworld of the Santi has three suns, which causes their planet to rotate chaotically around them, causing extreme weather changes, ice ages, and heat too hot to survive in. And even if they were able to build some type of habitat to survive that, 
it wouldn't be sustainable because the biggest problem in their survival is when all three suns line up to create a gravitational pull so strong that it literally rips the planet apart. In the books, it's called the Great Rift and it cracks the homeworld like an egg. Their only options would to be pack up and live on spaceships, which isn't a good option when you understand the mechanics of the dark forest and the rules of space, or look towards space to find another suitable solar system. Their planet is broken and cannot be fixed. Why waste resources in a useless fight against three suns? The moment they realized there was another planet out there, ripe for the taking, it became obvious that it's the most effective way to survive. Failure to understand this is a failure to understand the basis of the three-body problem. Moving forward, why did the Santi tell humanity about their plan? And I genuinely love this question because it gets into the mindset of the Santi. This might not be a perfect example, but hopefully it helps. Have you by chance ever done yard work and on accident, you mow over an anthill? When it happened, did you think to yourself, oh no, I hope the ants don't hear me coming, I should conceal the noise of my lawnmower. Probably not. The Santi are so much more advanced that they don't believe humans have any business being upset about their plans. To them, humanity is a much lower life form, like a bug. They don't stop humanity from learning about the Sofans because they genuinely don't think Earth could do anything about it. It also works well as a way to demoralize the enemy. And it works pretty well. We saw how hopeless some of the characters are at the end of the last episode. When looking at the big picture, many of the characters believe nothing can be done, which leads to De Shi to take them out to a field and give a speech about how resilient bugs are. Just because something is less advanced doesn't mean it can be eradicated. Bugs always find a way to survive. This seems like a good spot to wrap things up, and if you enjoyed this video, please show it some love by liking it and subscribe to the channel. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Discord. I'll continue making more three-body content, and I'll see you all back next time.